Well, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Dubois. I'm the pastor at Western Mountains Baptist Church. We're located in uh, the town of New Portland, Maine. And uh, we're coming to you today on Palm Sunday. So happy Palm Sunday to you all. And today we're going to start by reading about the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem, a mere four days preceding his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. I've always found this scene to be fascinating, and, and here's why. There, there's such a celebration, a celebration of Jesus in this moment, as we will see. Yet, just four days later, the tide has turned so significantly that essentially the same crowd would rather release Barabbas, a thief and a murderer, onto their city than to release Jesus. The very same man that they called the son of David. The one they said, he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna or save us. This morning, we're going to explore the why. Why the flip? What happened that the people so changed their mind about this Jesus? I'm going to give you a little hint with the, with the sermon title. It's called Change or Die. I know, harsh title today, but a very real message that seems very appropriate for our time. We'll get to the why in a bit, but let's start with the celebration, since it is what Jesus actually deserves, our admiration, our worship, and our praise. Hopefully you have your Bibles with you, and you can turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to work in chapter 21 for most of our morning. So Matthew 21, and we're going to start with the first nine verses. Matthew 21, 1 through 9, they read like this. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone has anything... If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, we could talk uh, about the humble obedience of, his, of the disciples going to ask a complete stranger for the use of his donkey and his colt. We could talk about the miracle of this complete stranger giving up his animals in order to serve Jesus at this time. We could talk about this whole scene fulfilling messianic prophecy. We could talk about the significance of the spreading of the palms and the coats in the road. But today, today I want to look quickly at the adoration, the praise that Jesus received from this crowd uh, found in verse 9. They were shouting, Matthew tells us, Hosanna to the Son of David, which means, Save us, Son of David. The people, see, the people know the genealogical line that will deliver the Messiah, the Savior. And they have rightly placed Jesus in this line. The people recognize that Jesus has been sent by God. Matthew tells us, they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They have either seen or heard about his teaching and his preaching. They have either seen or heard about his miraculous healing of the sick. They have either seen or heard about his casting out demons. And they recognize that the power to do these things comes from the Lord. It comes from God Almighty. They even assign Jesus the ultimate position, Hosanna in the highest. They place Jesus at the head of the line, right where he belongs. 
Now, if you have been following us through the early chapters of the Gospel of Mark, you may recall an interesting pattern of behavior that we have seen in Jesus. Often, after healing this one or that one, or casting out a demon from this one or that one, Jesus tells the receiver of his power, do not tell anyone of what has happened to you. See, it was not yet his time to be fully known. But now, now we see Jesus orchestrate this event, this triumphal entry into the city. And he is essentially allowing the people to worship him, to, to praise him, to recognize him for all that has been done in preparation for this day. It's a big shift in how Jesus ministers. And there is a reason for this. The time is coming. The time for Jesus to finish the true task at hand, which we'll celebrate on Sunday, a week from today. Now, last week, we saw Jesus dealing with the preparation of the disciples for the times ahead. In fact, in the first few verses, even this morning, we see more preparation. Go into the village and, and find the donkey and the colt. Retrieve them for me for this moment. It is preparation for the triumphal entry. But with this transition, but with this transition to be to being known, Jesus also makes another more subtle change. Jesus also begins to be much more aggressive in his teaching. And I'm going to give us an, an, a single example of this this morning, but here is my challenge to all of us. Let's spend time this week reading in all four of the Gospels the passages between the triumphal entry and the arrest of Jesus to see how serious Jesus got in confronting the people with their sins, with their false worship, with their weak prayer life, with their empty religious activities. I will even help you with where these passages can be found. If you've got a pen and a piece of paper, now is a great time to pick it up. Here's where these passages can be found. In the Gospel of Matthew, you could read from chapter 21 to chapter 27. In the Gospel of Mark, you could read from chapter 11 to chapter 15. In the Gospel of Luke, you could read from chapter 19 to chapter 23. And in the Gospel of John, you could read from chapter 12 to chapter 18. And yes, you will see many of the same parables and much of the same teaching, but this will only, I hope, reinforce how serious Jesus was and is in showing us a better way. Well, let's look together at one such example found just a few verses over from where we left off in the Gospel of Matthew. It's chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. And they read like this. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you are making it a robber's den. This has always been one of my favorite passages, just because we see Jesus take strong action. Some, some folks seem to think that Jesus is some kind of pacifist, but this passage tells us something much different. But here is what I hope we see in these two verses. I hope we see that Jesus is calling for change. Religion is not about making money. How silly to think that it would be. Jesus is calling for the people to return his house to a house of prayer. The focus of the people was on meeting their own needs and their own wants. And it was, it was not just the money changers and the sellers. Note that Matthew includes the buyers and those that were driven out. The buyers were looking for the convenience of purchasing their sacrifice right there at the temple instead of raising it themselves and then feeling the loss that God intended for them to feel when the sacrifice is made. 
Folks, sin costs us more than we are typically prepared to pay. And Jesus is telling the buyers, you have cheapened this process of the sacrifice. You are missing the point. It's time for change. And as we read through the passages in the Gospels that I just laid out, I think what we will see, what we will all see, is, is this kind of this major theme. Confess, repent, be sanctified. In other words, recognize our sins and the need to confess them to God. Turn and run in the opposite direction of our sins and run instead into the arms of Jesus. And then continue in the sanctification process, which is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. These things all require some form of change. Now, maybe it's a, a change in our attitudes. Maybe it is a change in our behaviors. Maybe it is a change in literally our outlook on life. And, or maybe it's all of these and more. The reason I'm kind of hammering on this concept of change is this. I read an article this week about our natural willingness to change. And it was not a religious article, but related to our, our physical health. And the article quoted statistical studies that said that between 80 and 90 percent of people faced with a need for a life-saving change will not make that change. 80 to 90 percent. The article spoke to people who had had who had undergone major uh, heart bypass surgery and were instructed by their medical team to change lifestyle habits that had caused their heart condition in the first place. And guess what? It was diet and exercise. Big surprise. Change your diet and begin to exercise or die. Somewhere between 80 and and 90% of the people refused to change even in the face of death. Those numbers blew my mind. But then I began to think of the life application lesson in this for all of us. Jesus, in his last few days on this earth, ramped up the seriousness of his teaching to address this very same issue, change or die. His words would have been something more like, follow me or spend eternity in hell. But, but the concept is very much the same, for the wages of sin is death. We find that in Romans 6.23. Let's bring that down to our, our present day reality. The local, state, and federal governments are now basically singing the same tune. They're saying, change or die. Change your behaviors and your patterns of living or die. Practice this new concept of social distancing, isolation, quarantine, or die. And, and what are we seeing? People who are unwilling to change. Maybe you saw the loaded beaches in Florida. Maybe you saw the crowds watching the Navy hospital ship enter New York Harbor. New York, the epicenter of COVID-19, and the people still came out in droves. These are excellent, though bleak, examples of our unwillingness to change. So there you have it. How does a crowd that worships and praises Jesus as he enters the city of Jerusalem on Sunday become the crowd that yells, crucify him on Friday? It is a crowd that did not want to hear about change. It is a crowd that did not want to confront their need to change. It is a crowd that thinks, I'll be okay. Everything's going to be just fine. It's a crowd that says, who do you think you are telling me I need to change? So, 
Instead of hearing the instructions of Jesus and, and heeding his instructions, the people reject him. And they do not just reject his teaching, but they reject the man and instead call for his head. Yes, it is harsh, but does that make it any less true? Change or die? Read these gospel passages and see if Jesus is calling for some changes in our own lives. As we prepare for Easter next week, see if there are some things in our own lives that need confession, that need repentance, that need changing. I know there are in my own life. So, time in his word and time in prayer will be my charge this week. Maybe you're listening this morning and you're hearing some of this for the very first time. And let me say to you, that yes, the wages of sin is death, but according to that, the rest of that same verse in Romans 6.23, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Well, what does that mean? It means that God so loved you and me that he gave us the gift of his son, Jesus, who lived in sinless perfection so that he could take on the sins of the whole world on that cross. It means that Jesus shed his blood for the remission of my sins. It means that for those who call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved from the penalty of their sins, past, present, and future. Friends, follow Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to mold you and shape you more into the image of of Jesus each and every day. Let us not fear change, but instead let us embrace change. And together we can weather these changes. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for a time in your word this morning. I thank you for all those that are, that are listening, Lord. And I pray that um, with so much going on around us, so much change being uh, required of us, that we would not fear that, but instead understand, Lord, that uh, even, uh, even the craziness, you are still in it. You are still with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. You'll be with us to the end of the age. And Lord, we can count on you to be the one constant through all of this change. Lord, may we not fear it, but instead embrace it. And uh, Lord, may we be about your business, looking out for one another, speaking to one another, enjoying one another's company, even if it is virtually. However you want us to make this happen, Lord, may we hear you. May we follow your guidance. Direct our steps, we pray. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you'll join us again next week. We'll do this again. Um, uh, we're doing it now out of the comfort of my home as opposed to the church, since we're not supposed to gather or, or be out unnecessarily. Um, but I hope the day comes quickly where we're able to gather once again. Man, I miss seeing you all. I miss uh, the hugs and the handshakes and the smiles. Uh, but we'll get back at it soon. I uh, love you all.